Ladies and gentlemen, Alapa, welcome to Harry's Deepenings. Today, we get to part two of our study on this discussion of the revelation of St. John. So I hope you're all well, and we're going to try and go a bit deeper now and try and tackle some questions that we may have or just reflect what we have learnt about this particular chapter as we go through. We are starting with this chapter 11, the commentary on the 11th chapter of the revelation of John. Now, I thought we'd go through this. It's a very interesting one. What exactly is this revelation of John, the revelation of St. John? Dear Pete, could I ask you to read for us? The revelation of St. John. Revelation to John is the last biblical book of the New Testament. It is the only book of the New Testament classified as apocalyptic literature rather than didactic or historical, indicating thereby its extensive use of visions, symbols and allegory, especially in connection with future events. Revelation to John appears to be a collection of separate units composed by unknown authors who lived during the last quarter of the first century, though it purports to have been written by an individual named John who calls himself the servant of Jesus. Thank you very much. So we don't know exactly who this has been written by. And there's some debates about it. This tells us a little bit about who is this individual, but it's about being a servant of Jesus. And this, again, is the standard that we all want to be. We want to be servants of God. We look at the son of Baha'u'llah, who, of course, was the servant of Baha, Abdul Baha. This is the only book of the New Testament that's classified as apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic, of course, refers to the end of the world and, and prophecies and what might happen in regards to that, as opposed to didactic, which is more to do with teachings. Dear Pete, your hand raised. My understanding from what I've heard is that actually the phrase end of the world is a mistranslation. It actually means end of the age. So you could speculate it's the end of the age of the kingdom of man on earth and the beginning of the kingdom of God on earth, a transition between one kingdom and another. So it's the end of one age and the beginning of a new age. Thank you, dear Pete. In fact, yes, you're right. that The two words that can be interchangeably used sometimes are cosmos and iron. Cosmos refers more to the end of the world, whereas iron is more the end of the age. And the word that's used uh, when it speaks about the end of the world as it's translated by some is actually ion, which would, you are right, Pete, would be the end of the age. You're, you're quite right. Then there's talk of a reed. We're meant to be make ourselves like reeds. There's an explanation given by Abdul Baha of how man should become a reed, how they should use the reed. And the perfect man is like a reed, which is free of self and allows beautiful melodies of the divine scripture to be played by the true flute player, God. And it also mentions a rod, and this rod comes in because he is the helper and support of human beings, leading them as a divine shepherd would. And if you've ever seen a shepherd lead his sheep, well, he uses his staff, he uses rod to help guide them. It speaks about Jerusalem being subdued for 42 months. The Muslim calendar uses the lunar calendar, so each lunar month has 30 days in it. So if we're speaking of 42 months, well, we can multiply 42 by 30 to get the number of days. This gives us 1260 days until the coming of the Bab and uh, the condition of Jerusalem changing. And this 1260 days, as we've mentioned in Ezekiel, it makes it quite clear that each day is to be taken as a year. So this is 1260 years. Now, in the 7th century, the 7th century AD, Jerusalem was conquered, and the Holy of Holies, the House of Solomon, was preserved. But the outer court was taken and given to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. And during this period, Jerusalem had lost its glory that it had until the year 1260. And this relates to 1844, when His Holiness the Bab had declared his mission and caused its rejuvenation. And Abdul Baha speaks about the differences that you would see from 1844 through to 1904, 1906. 
And he said, you'd recognize it as becoming honored, as populous, as flourishing again, that there was a change. In the seventh century, the land of Israel had passed through the hands of many. There was the invasion by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Roman and the Byzantine empires that had taken over this holy land. And it was in the seventh century that it was taken over by the, the Muslims. And then it changed hands a few times until the Ottoman Empire took control of it in 1517. And then the Ottoman Empire rules on until the 1900s. 1908 was the Young Turks Revolution. Abu Baha is speaking about two parts of religion. He speaks about the inner form and the outer form of religion, with the spiritual laws not changing at all. The second part refers to the material things, and that is modified according to the necessities of time. And this perhaps refers to fasting, or prayers, different forms of worship, marriage and divorce, the abolition of slavery, legal processes, the list goes on. So that reference is being made just there. So now we'll go on to talk about these witnesses. It speaks about witnesses, and it's uh, something that's baffled people for a very long time. It says, power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These witnesses spoke of here, Abu Baha explains, are referring to the prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Imam Ali. The uh, prophet was like the root, and Ali was like the branch, as, for example, Moses and Joshua respectively were. And we've mentioned this uh, 1,260 days. This was the dispensation of Islam. And it appeared in sackcloth. Now, what does this uh, mean in sackcloth? Well, Outwardly, as people looked at the Prophet, or as they looked at Imam Ali, they may have seen from their clothes that they, they looked just the same. They weren't they weren't floating in the sky. They didn't have these big halos on them or anything. They just looked like the people of the time. But inwardly, they were incredibly, incredibly different. And the teachings that the Prophet had, through God, brought forth were to revolutionize much of the world. And Imam Ali was doing a similar thing so this is this is where it speaks about these two witnesses something that in christianity there is debate about again who are these witnesses what is it a reference to abdul baha is giving us through the revelation of baha'u'llah and his understanding that this is what these two witnesses were a reference to and they come they prophesy for 1260 days so again the dispensation of islam was to last that long then there's a, another quote here that says, the beast that has ascended out of the bottomless pit. What is this a reference to? Well, this is a reference to the Umayyads, who has started attacking them from the pit of error, if you like, attacking the love of God, and would oppose the teachings and institutions to get rid of their power, to, to do everything they could. Now, remember, Islam had a split after the prophet had passed away, there were some who believed Imam Ali, the first Imam of Shia Islam, was the one to take over the reins of the faith. But there were the Sunnis who believed that Abu Bakr was to take over, then Umar, Uthman, and then Ali, and then it would go a different way. And the understanding that we have as Baha'is is that certainly initially that the Shia path was a lot truer to the cause that was meant to be, was fulfilling the covenant, that Ali was indeed meant to be in charge. Now, I make this very, very clear indeed when it's speaking about you know, the beast. It's not a reference to the people that call themselves Sunnis today in any way, shape or form, or even the people at the time. What had happened, the understanding is that there was a, a power struggle, arguably, and some people who didn't recognize the validity of Ali, well, this is where they were going after them, they were going after the power, and that's what it's talking about. So, um, very different to the people in a generality, not to be confused in any way, shape, or form. But this is what had taken place. Ali was being attacked. The Prophet had, had passed away, and that's where there was some dispute over who should take over the reins of the faith. After three and a half days, the life of God entered into these bodies. Not literally, but these renewed witnesses 
were now to come about and they were the Bab and Godus. So we've discussed three and a half days being well if you were to take these days to be years, three and a half years. How many months is that? So that's 42 months, which is 1260, the dispensation. So there's different ways you could look at this prophecy. Again, there was this renewal of these witnesses that previously had been the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Imam Ali. Now we're seeing them come about, these witnesses, they've, they've been renewed, the witnesses, and then now His Holiness the Bab and Godus. It then speaks about this sign of the end of the times. But just before we go on, dear Shah al your hand was raised. Yes, yes. I just wanted to mention, also it was the tradition that the older men of the tribe would head and so I think some of it had to do with tradition. And that's why Ali, for the sake of uh, uh, unity of the tribes, did not fight them and allowed for Abu Bakr, Omar, and Isma to become the, the leaders. But uh, it is interesting that the Sunnis, although they do accept this process, deviated from the directive of the imams to caliphate. So it became more of a ruling thing rather than a, a religious thing. Quite right, Shah Khan. Thank you so much. Yes. Remember, the older you were, the more knowledgeable you were. And of course, the bigger your beard was, the more knowledgeable you were. And again, for some people, that is still a thing today. The bigger beard means you're wiser, you've got more knowledge. But when the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came, he came to revolutionize the world, to change the world. And those people who had that keen insight were able to really take from the fruits of that. And as we know, Islam had a considerable effect, a positive effect on civilization. And that goes true for the, the Sunnis and the Shias, of course, that there was a power that was there. But this particular thing that it's speaking about, this beast that ascended, was this thing attacking essentially the covenant that was there. And that's what it caused. But many, many amazing things have been brought about by both groups who are ultimately, they're both just Muslims. So there is the signs of the end of the times in the Bible. And it says in the text that we read, it says at the same hour, there was a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing language it's using there. So it's speaking about this earthquake that had uh, taken place. The city had fallen. Then there were 7,000 that were affected. Now, after the martyrdom of His Holiness the Bab, the city of Shiraz was in turmoil as an earthquake had occurred. If you remember, there was a torrential downpour that had taken place in Shiraz. There was diseases, there was cholera, there was famine, and afflictions occurred that never had been before. It says here that the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Well, what are these woes? What exactly are they? Now, a woe is a bad thing, actually. Like, woe betide you. You get shocked, you get a bit scared as to what had happened. Now, let's look at who these woes are. The first woe is the appearance of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The second woe is none other than His Holiness, the Bab. And the third woe is Baha'u'llah. And Baha'u'llah's revelation started very quickly after His Holiness, the Bab. The Bab's dispensation, it was 1844 that he declared his mission. And then it was in 63 that His Holiness, Baha'u'llah, publicly declared his mission. So even though his dispensation took over from 53, so it was nine years, you could say that the dispensation of the Bab was there, and then 19 years, that when Baha'u'llah officially told everyone that it was him. So again, we look at this prophecy, and it speaks about these woes and what had happened. It was of the second woe was passed, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Now, why are they woes? What is it? Surely it's it's good news. The coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the coming of the Bab, the coming of Baha'u'llah is excellent news. Well, yes, it is excellent news if we are to recognize their divinity, if we are to do that. But God forbid if one were to wax proud in the face of the Prophet, to wax proud in the face of Baha'u'llah, of the Bab, to turn away, to attack 
then that is a very striking woe, and it is quite horrific. Dear Pete. It's interesting to me that in the gospel text, um, Jesus says to Peter, or he says to the disciples, who, who do the people say I am? And they came up with various answers, and Peter made his declaration. And Jesus says, on this rock, I'll build my church. So on his declaration of faith, he'll build his church. And then later, on the night before the crucifixion, Jesus says to Peter, by the way, you're going to deny me three times before the dawn of the next day. So I think it's not a coincidence. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pete. Thank you. This is coming from my Catholic background. Um, we're taught in catechism that Jesus Christ was supposed to be the Prince of Peace. But the thing is, it seems to me there's this contradiction where you saw in the Gospels, it says that I doth not come to bring peace, but a sword. And I'll divide father against children and mom and dad and all that kind of stuff. So anybody who refers to Jesus Christ as being the Prince of Peace, it seems to me that's a misinterpretation of Scripture. And what was this this sword that Jesus brought? What was that? Uh, do you understand that a reference to me, uh, Terry? Any thoughts on that? I think the sword is basically his word. Uh, I, I don't think it was a physical sword. I think it was more like a, a, a metaphorical type of thing. So it wasn't a literal sword. You're right. It was the word. And it was the it was the thing that would separate brothers, that would separate families, that it was such a powerful rod, as it were, that he came to rule with. Um, so it was like a sword that would that would completely cut through. It was the word. I think you are right indeed there. So, so thank you very much for sharing that with us. Dear Helen. Hi, um, Dave. I'm wondering what why it's called a woe as opposed to something joyful. Um, I mean, you could say it's 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 sad because people are denying them and they're suffering, but why, but I'm just wondering why are manifestations of God coming being referred to as woe excellent question dear Helen and uh, as I tried to touch on that we can see through history that the majority of the people would deny the manifestation whether it was his holiness Moses his holiness Christ um, the prophets uh, the Bar, Baha'u'llah that they were denied that they went through utter utter suffering and again, the woe is a specific reference that that woe is for the unbeliever, for those who don't recognize. So, sure, one could say very positive things about the coming of the manifestation, and it does say that in many places. But it also here, it refers to it as a woe because there were countless who did not recognize, who actually went against the prophets, that went against the manifestations of God. And that's why they are a woes. There are woes from their perspective. And that's what it's about. But to your point, there are other places, of course, where it's uh, where the the beauty with which they're described is also there. So I think it's just trying to address that point there, dear Helen, if that makes sense. Thank great, you. Great question. Great question. I mean, this alone for me is utterly fascinating that it speaks of these woes. The second one will come. The third one will come quickly. And that's precisely what happens. This is prophecy fulfilled by His Holiness Baha'u'llah coming so quickly after the short, incredibly short dispensation of His Holiness the Bab. And only now does it really make sense if you were to view it through this lens. Isn't it fascinating that so long ago this was, this was prophesied that this is going to take place, this incredible, incredible event. And here we are all, and we're able to understand this, to uh, live in a time where we, we are seeing this come to fruition. Again, the Guardian speaks a lot and the promised day has come. How great is this day? How great is this day? And he, he goes on and he lists these various different things. So we must really recognise the bounty that we have before us. We will come on to this bit here, which speaks about the 24 elders. It says, and the four and 20 elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, we give be thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. The elders that we're speaking of, or the guardians, the holy souls, have been 12 in each cycle. And if we were to look at the time of Moses, there were the 12 tribes of Israel. Christ had 12 apostles. In Shia Islam, there's 12 imams. But in this dispensation, we 
have 24. And why are there 24 in this glorious cycle? We're told that there are 24. And the reason there are 24, uh, one could say, is because of the, the greatness of this day requiring it. If we look again at this graphic here, you have the Adamic cycle there. That was some 6,000 years, which was great and brought many fruits. But now we have this new cycle, the Baha'i cycle, the cycle of fulfillment that we're told, which will last 500,000 years. So that's why there are these 24 guardians. For these 24 elders, Abdul Baha says, 19 of them are the Bab and Letters of the Living. The Guardian in 1943 had written a letter stating exactly the same, and that these five elders will become known in the future. Let's look at this that's quoted in Revelation as well. And there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and a great earthquake, the likes of which had not occurred since men were upon the earth. So mighty was the great quake. So what are these various things? Well, the lightning, we are told, is the anger and wrath of God amidst the storm. The thunder is the noise of the violation of the covenant. The earthquake is the existence of doubts. The hail is the existence of torments beating on the violators of the covenant. And the trials and temptations will befall even professed believers. 